reason that we chose labor and employment law as the first themed uh, institute is that it really is pervading the social landscape as a topic that affects almost everybody in America. Um, between the importance of what happens at one, one's own workplace or the company one, one interacts with, the social media implications on labor and employment have really become an important issue at a national level. We see this, the National Labor Relations Board General Counsel has published three different memoranda explaining how companies are supposed to operate in this space. We see a tremendous amount in the press about how to manage this. And so it really has become a, a, a very important topic for uh, society. So you might be wondering, all right, fine. Social media and electronic media exists. It's used in the workplace. So what? Why should it be regulated? What's the big whoop? Well, a few years ago, there was a survey in American universities done um, from at least 3,000 students and young professionals, and it found that at least half of these young professionals and students would not accept employment in a workplace where the workplace bans or restricts uh, the use of electronic and social media in that specific workplace. Or they said that, yes, fine, we'll accept employment, but if you take a look there at the bottom, we'll try to find a way to bypass the restriction or the ban. Now, that's throwing a span in the works of a healthy labor relationship in the workplace, uh, if there was, if, if, uh, was one. The fact, ladies and gentlemen, is that without proper regulation of social and electronic media in the workplace, employees will continue to spend valuable working hours online um, updating their statuses or chatting to friends or seeing what the wife's up to and so on and so forth. So the question really is to find the, the pass, the balance between the rights of the employees on the one side and the needs of the employer on the other side. The whole question about over-regulation or under-regulation when it comes to social media and the use of electronic media. Now, social media and information use. We see similar to what happened with the Electronic Communications Privacy Act being passed um, when um, it wasn't enough for the Fourth Amendment to protect privacy interests of individuals from, you know, from wiretapping or access of stored and electronic communications. I think we see the same thing nowadays with employers and universities trying to get greater access to information about their employees and their students. Um, and the Fourth Amendment's not going to be enough to protect them. The Electronic Communications Privacy Act and other laws that exist right now are not enough because of the leverage that employers have over um, those employees who want, you know, a good job or much less any job. And so I see the need for the government to intervene to protect those privacy interests. Um, and so I think that um, definitely the state government's on the right path now with trying to protect privacy and say social media accounts of employees, uh, but I think the federal government really needs to step up and come in with a comprehensive plan um, so that we can enable employees to continue to use social media you know, and other um, modes of communication electronically and to preserve their ability to express themselves via those modes. I think with regard to how I see uh, the landscape changing over the next 10 years, um, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, I think that the changes that we've seen even in the past decade are probably ones that we never really could have imagined. Uh, the increasing use of social media, the increased use of electronic tracking devices um, online to kind of monitor what people are doing. Um, I think in the past there was this thought that these individual bits of information out there really couldn't be linked to um, individual Individuals. Um, what we're now finding is that it can be linked and so um, in the next 10 years I think maybe there might be some um, pushback from um, the idea that there is such a thing as personally identifiable information and non-personally identifiable information because um, as a lot of academic commentators have um, been starting to um, uh, talk about is the fact, and and um, beyond academics um, in both the uh, at the FTC level, the White House level, is that increasingly the idea of uh, information being non-personally identifiable it, it just doesn't exist really. Um, that dividing line is very murky, and because of that, there is a. Um, 
there is a need to recognize that information um, is going to be linked together. So I think there are going to be, in terms of attorneys and lo new lawyers, uh, an increasing uh, increased attention paid to issues of privacy um, as well as um, uh, issues uh, surrounding um, what's done with this information and the context, some sort of a contextual based model. But I think privacy issues are going to be big ones um, in the coming decade. Now that we have all this information, are there some limits we should place on it? And I think that's where um, there will probably be, probably be a lot of attention. Uh, it's a challenging market right now for graduates. And one thing you should be thinking about is what kind of value can I bring to, to a possible employer? Practicing attorneys are very skilled in the traditional kinds of lawyer tasks. They know how to cross-examine. They generate business. They know how to uh, draft documents. But what they don't have time to do is keep abreast of, of recent events and, and recent technologies. They just don't have time to stay abreast of what's available now in terms of the software and hardware that they could use in employment practice. They don't really know what the issues are in social media, except that the ones that have been highly publicized, but more importantly, how is the best way to use it? How should we be using it? To the degree that you can master some of this technology, I think you can bring value to a firm in the sense that you have some understanding that the partners don't have, as opposed to some of the substantive legal knowledge that they've accumulated over the years. You can't compete with that. But these cutting edge ideas, these new technologies, you certainly can bring value to the firm. You know, there are actually a couple of problems that entrepreneurs have with, with um, the information age. But one of the problems is not anything they're doing wrong. It's the fact that there's so much that they have to master when they're starting a business. They cannot become the instant um, experts on everything to do with informatics along with running their business keep doing the financing, keeping their books, and so on. Um, some of them, and, and they react in two different ways, some of them immediately think they have to have everything worked out and they, they need um, advice, whether it's legal advice or just business counseling on setting up a patent, uh, making sure they own all the in intellectual property, um, mastering every aspect of, um, you know, they, they think they have to set up a, a website first thing. In some businesses that may be very useful, but in other businesses it's more important to make sure that they actually have their business concept worked out and it's something that's going to work before they create their website. How has social media impacted on disabilities? It's enabled a lot of people who are physically impaired, particularly people in which, um, quadriplegics or tetraplegics, are people who have um, a very easily infected, they have um, conditions that prevent them going out into the community. Now they have, now there's a, 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 um, an easy, readily friend base. So I have friends on uh, social media from um, Texas who I've never met, and, but we are both blind and we're both lawyers, so we communicate on that level. So it's enabled the connections across disability, people with disabilities around the world, and um, enabled people who otherwise could not have exited their house to exit their house virtually. It's a very interesting question. So what you are doing in a sense, you are connecting an area of international human rights law with an evolving area of cyberspace related legal development. So the question you pose is how the changing norms of self-determination that I propose in that uh, 2005 article is applicable today in the changing legal landscape of social media practices. When looking at the question of how law firms evolve to deal with the information age, we see a good leadership has been taken by the American Bar Association. In the Ethics 2020 changes to the rules of professional responsibility, there were a number of places where technology became affirmative professional responsibility duties. That affects every lawyer practicing every type of law. So today a lawyer has to protect one's information of one's client in all forms, whether it is paper forms that are uh, locked up or it is digital information that's stored in the company's servers or in the cloud. In 
advising a company, whether it is on labor and employment issues, whether it's on white collar crime issues, whether it's on med mal, the fact that technology is mediating that relationship that gave rise to the transaction or to the uh, tort means that the law firm has to be aware of how the technology is changing the relationship between the parties and what's the appropriate legal remedy in that situation. So law firms can't stick their head in the sands and you're seeing the most sophisticated and aggressive law firms make a new business model out of this. Now it's also worth noting that the most sophisticated and aggressive of those law firms may not be the largest. And so we're seeing tremendous growth and development by firms in the two to 10 person size by embracing technology, using technology in their own practice, and showing how technology affects and benefits their clients. Those are the firms that are gonna be leading uh, the legal com uh, community of tomorrow. Within the scope of informatics and its um, impact on labor and employment, I think the best advice for newly hired corporate counsel um, is two things. Number one, you may be newly hired at a junior level. You have people who are senior to you, but you may know a lot more about informatics than, than your boss and your boss's boss. That does not mean that you have to walk in and be cocky and say, I know all this stuff and you don't know what you're talking about, but you can actually bring great value by, in, by sharing your knowledge and your um, facility with, with um, anything having to do with high tech. There are a lot of senior managers who really c will appreciate um, the advice. At the same time, I think you have to be very thoughtful. Y you almost, as, as a lawyer, coming in, um, you, ha you have to become the immediate expert on the legal issues. So it's not just enough to know what the, um, what the technology does, but really being stepping back and being thoughtful about how can, how can I learn about the legal issues and how can I really help, help the organization that I'm working for um, advance and, and implement good policies and um, follow the policies well. It's a challenging market right now for graduates. And one thing you should be thinking about is what kind of value can I bring to, to a possible employer? Practicing attorneys are very skilled in the traditional kinds of lawyer tasks. They know how to cross-examine. They generate business. They know how to uh, draft documents. But what they don't have time to do is keep abreast of, of recent events and, and recent technologies. They just don't have time to stay abreast of what's available now in terms of the software and hardware that they could use in employment practice. They don't really know what the issues are in social media, except that the ones that have been highly publicized, but more importantly, how is the best way to use it? How should we be using it? To the degree that you can master some of this technology, I think you can bring value to a firm in the sense that you have some understanding that the partners don't have, as opposed to some of the substantive legal knowledge that they've accumulated over the years. You can't compete with that. But these cutting edge ideas, these new technologies, you certainly can bring value to the firm. So if the employer, or if I can leave you with one specific message in this regard, and if the employer can leave these employees with one specific message in mind, it's basically, don't say anything online that you wouldn't want plastered on a billboard with your face on it. There's so much information available that, uh, that it's daunting. And uh, I find myself at times even receding from it that uh, I've, got to, I've got to hide from some of the stuff because too much is coming today. Um, one thing in particular I took from today is, and we mentioned it during our roundtable, this idea of specificity. There now are requirements that are overlapping and they may be inconsistent in a broad sense. So you have to be particularly careful when you're drafting media policies, for instance, that you do what's required to protect yourself from discrimination liability by prohibiting certain kinds of communication but you're not having such broad bans on communication that you're now interfering with protected concerted activity, the kinds of communications that employees are entitled to engage in. And we're, we're now in this area where we're having to draw some, some fine lines where it's not entirely clear where that line is. Uh, and, and that's a real challenge. What would I say are the takeaways from today's symposium? I think the first comment that the speakers repeated over and over again is that social media policies need to be very specific and narrowly crafted. It's very important to encourage one's employees to be smart and to be safe and to be thoughtful, 
But when it comes to prohibitions, the prohibitions need to be very narrow, very specific, and make sure that they don't interfere with the employment rights that an individual has at work.